So we might well ask, how can she help us out in any meaningful way, given that she never experienced sin or temptation? In actual truth, the, the, um, the, the, the truth is the exact opposite. It is because of her freedom from sin that she is the best person to help us in our own um, journey towards God willing heaven. Since her soul is so beautiful and so pure, she loves us in a way that is much greater than any other human being can love. In fact, the holier we are, the more we love others. Because the more the holier we are, the, the better inclined we are to see the image of God in other people. And of course, Our Lady is the holiest person to have ever existed. Therefore, she is the one who can love us more than anyone else. Our Lady loves us even more than our own, than our own parents. She truly is our mother who looks out for us and is always ready to help us. All we have to do is to ask her to help us, to ask her to be close to us when we are sad or when we are suffering and to ask her to pray to God for us. The best way for us to talk to Our Lady and become friends with her is by, recitation, by the recitation of the Holy Rosary because it is her favorite prayer. Every time we ask her for things when praying the Rosary, she will always give them to us provided, of course, that these things we ask are for our own salvation, for our own good. Every Hail Mary we say in the, ro the rosary is like a beautiful rose that we lay at Our Lady's feet, and she will reward us in this life and in heaven for all the times that we gave her these roses by praying the rosary. So the rosary is the best way for us to become close to Our Lady, and she in turn will reward us by bringing us close to her son. If you don't already do so, it, it perhaps would be a good idea this Advent to begin saying the rosary every day. Um, it only takes about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how fast or how slowly you say it. Um, and while do it while praying the rosary, asking Our Lady to prepare our soul to meet the baby Jesus on Christmas Day. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, for just one uh, one technical note for the files that are coming in the chat. So, but if you if you don't manage to to download it, you will uh, you will find also the first two lessons in the in in, in our website. So I'll leave now the. Stage su Maurizio. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Maurizio. Um, I'm very happy to be with you. A very warm welcome to everybody, to the, the children. And thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us on uh, this uh, second uh, talk. Now we're going to share the uh, image. Right, um, this is the second uh, talk and it's about uh, uh, belonging. And uh, the first one, um, I was following the, the liturgy of the week. And uh, uh, this time, as, uh, as you can see, and as you will hear, uh, I focus on uh, the, the liturgy of the 8th of December. And uh, the, the title is Belonging. Uh, in our times, uh, there is this dangerous misconception uh, that we can make of ourselves what we want, what we like. Uh, our Lady belonged to, to God, and God has taught us, has shown us uh, that uh, we belong to our families, to him, to our families, to our communities, and to the cultural and religious background we come from. So the week is from the 6th to the 12th. Uh, but uh, we were talking about the Immaculate Conception and uh, um, Brother uh, James, and uh, congratulations, <laughs> Brother James, um, talked about the Immaculate Conception. I would like just to show you uh, a picture by Diego Velasquez, uh, one of the most important artists in the 17th century Spain. He was 19 when he painted the Immaculate Conception you're looking at. Um, 16, 18, 16, 19 is the date, and it's at the National Gallery in London. 
and uh, you can see um, a young girl um, and the features probably remind us of a Spanish um, young girl from Seville, the, the town where the artist was born. And uh, the last case that follows the, the description in the book of Revelation by St. John the Evangelist. And you can see the 12 stars uh, was challenging the, or I wanted to challenge the children to count the stars, 12 stars around our lady's head. And uh, she looks down in humility and she's praying for us. You can see that she's surrounded by clouds, but behind her, there's the sun. And in the uh, scriptures, in the book of Revelation, she, she's clothed with, with the sun. And uh, she's on the moon. And uh, look at the moon. The moon is where she's standing, and it's transparent. Now, you really have to have a magnifying glass to see the lower part of the painting. But there are all symbols of Our Lady. There are towers. She is the, the Tower of David. Uh, there's a temple, the Temple of Wisdom on the left hand side. And uh, through the moon, you can see actually the sea where there is a ship. And uh, so there is another reference to her. And she's the star of the morning. So the fountain as well, the fountain of wisdom and the mirror of uh, uh, justice. So although the day is, of course, uh, dedicated to, to her, the, the scriptures, uh, um, the gospel uh, of that day is about the Annunciation. And the, the first painting uh, that I want to show you about the Annunciation is by uh, Duccio di Boninsegna. And uh, uh, it's a very small uh, uh, panel. It's a predella. Uh, last time I explained that the predella is a very small panel at the bottom of the an altarpiece. It's about 43 centimeters by 44. And uh, I will show you later where uh, this predella comes from. Actually, you can uh, see uh, this annunciation by Duccio at the National Gallery. Uh, let's look at the, uh, at the picture. So the background is a, a golden uh, background uh, and uh, it's like heaven but we are on earth. So it's a combination of heaven and earth. And the, there is this uh, beautiful architecture in pink and gray, uh, our lady's uh, uh, house. And the angel on the, the left, you can see that uh, um, is stepping forward, is striding uh, towards our lady with this uh, gentle gesture uh, to announce uh, the message that she will receive. And, um, in the middle, on the lower part, a vase with the uh, uh, lilies, that the symbol of purity uh, of Our Lady, and uh, and you can perceive that she's stepping um, uh, towards the door. She is really uh, afraid of what's happening, and she's holding a book. Um, she's reading a passage from Isaiah, and this uh, panel uh, comes from the magnificent uh, Maestà. It's a huge, huge uh, altarpiece. An altarpiece um, is placed above the altar. And in uh, medieval cathedrals, uh, um, it was a way to read the history, the biblical history from the Old and New Testament. And as you can see, this is a maista, it's uh, Our Lady in Majesty. This is the side uh, facing the congregation. And our Annunciation, you can see it in the lower part on the left-hand side. And it's like a book, it's a huge book. And you don't need to turn over the pages. And nowadays we use our mobiles and you have to change to close and to open the windows. But at the time, the congregation could read the whole history just in front of them. And it's a double-sided altarpiece. So this is the front and the back. Um, would face the uh, choir, and it's the, the story of Christ's life. Now, last week I showed you two predellas, and I wanted to just uh, to show them again, and it was the uh, healing of the blind man and uh, the transfiguration. And they are uh, next to each other, as you can see, and at the National Gallery, they are next to each other. So you uh, recover your sight, so the blind man uh, is healed, but then 
uh, the true sight is really to look at Christ transfigured. So in his uh, true nature, divine and human. The, the gospel of the, uh, of the day on the 8th of uh, December is from Luke 1, uh, 26, 38. And it starts with the uh, angel Gabriel. And I wanted to pay attention very, very briefly to the angel, because of course, we're always uh, looking at uh, uh, Our Lady and was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Her virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph uh, of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Now the, the, the three elements that I would like to draw your attention to is the angel. Now the, the one that you see on your left hand side is from an altarpiece by Titian and it's the Averoldi uh, polyptic. So it's a huge uh, altarpiece, but I wanted only to show you the angel, uh, Gabriel. And Gabriel means God is my strength. And uh, in the Annunciations, very often he carries a lily, symbol of purity, a trumpet, or a shining lantern, or a branch from paradise, a scroll, like in this case, Ave Gratia Plena, hail, full of grace, or a scepter. Nazareth is the place where the Annunciation took place. It's a city in Israel, in the Holy Land, and the Nazareth in Hebrew means branch, plant, flower. And uh, if you remember the stained glass window that I showed you last time about the, um, the Yeses uh, tree, um, the, the tree is in Hebrew plant. So there's a reference to the, the genealogy of um, the uh, Virgin Mary. And uh, last but not least, Joseph. And I will talk a little bit more about Joseph uh, um, on our third walk, uh, talk. But here I would like you uh, to admire uh, the famous marriage between Our Lady and uh, St. Joseph. The, the one on the left-hand side is by Raphael. And it was made in 1504 uh, for a church in Città di Castello in Umbria in Italy. And now the painting is at the uh, Pinacoteca of Brera in Milan. And the one on the right hand side is by Perugino. And uh, the painting was made in 1504, 1500, 1504. And it's in uh, Cannes in France. Now, why am I showing you these two paintings, one uh, next to each other? Uh, well, first of all, because uh, a reference to Joseph, to the marriage but also because you probably remember the theme of our talk is belonging. And in this case, uh, Perugino, um, the painting on the right, uh, was the master, was Raphael's master. So if you want really to learn, if you want to improve um, your skills, you have to follow a master and possibly you become better than the master. And Raphael certainly did. Now, if you look, on the left hand side, so Raphael's painting, um, it's the moment when there is this uh, marriage and in the history of art, uh, we say that it's probably the most beautiful uh, ring uh, in the history of art, or the most famous ring in the, in the history of art. Now, uh, why was Joseph uh, chosen? Well, there is a, an apocryphal um, story that, uh, um, there were many, many suitors and uh, um, the, the possibility to choose the right one was to pick up the, uh, the sticks or the stuffs uh, belonging to widowers and the, that stick should bloom. And it was Joseph who picked up the right stick, the right staff and it bloomed. So you can see this on the right hand side in the Perugino's painting and it's more visible above uh, Joseph's head. There is a, a staff with the three flowers. So he was the chosen one. And now we come really to the, the core of my meditation um, because um, when we look at an annunciation in art, we always think they're all, always the same. Maybe we can identify different styles at different times, but actually 
there are different moments, uh, and I would like really to draw attention, uh, draw attention to uh, these different moments. So as soon as the Virgin Mary received the message and the angel uh, turned up, she was troubled and she thought with herself. Then there was a question, um, how shall this be done? And, uh, and then the acceptance, behold the handmaid of the Lord. And, and then the angel departed. It was a medieval tradition to divide these moments in five stages. So when the Virgin Mary was troubled, there was a disquiet. And in Latin is a conturbatio. Then there's a cogitatio because uh, uh, there's a reflection. She wondered, she thinks. And then the interrogatio, she asks. And uh, so she, she wants to understand. And uh, finally, the submission, the humiliatio and the, the meritatio, the merit. So I would like to show you some works where we can identify these different moments. Now, this is by Simone Martini, and uh, uh, it's a 1333, so beginning of the 14th century. And it's a detail of a big polyptic, um, and it is displayed in the Uffizi Gallery in, in Italy, in Florence. As you can see, the background is gold leaf. You see the, um, the, the phrase, I don't know if you can make it out, Ave, um, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, hail, holy. Mary, um, God is with you. And uh, the angel on the left, splendidly uh, represented by Simone Martini with this crown of leaves, is holding a branch of olive tree and uh, olive leaves, a symbol of peace. And uh, what I always, uh, I'm always struck by the um, openness to accept different ideas from uh, different countries. For example, look at the uh, mantle, uh, I'm referring to the angel, and that text, excuse me, that textile comes from Mongolia. So it's a, a, a typical pattern, pattern, it comes from Mongolia. But that, that's also the idea to, not only to open up, but to, to uh, spread the, the word of God to other countries. And, uh, and also look at the, the Virgin Mary. This is the moment she's troubled. She's uh, um, in a way uh, surprised and it, she's startled and uh, um, she's, she's caught in the moment that she was reading, look at the book, the red book, and uh, she's reacting with this uh, a graceful and composed reluctance. Then there is, after the moment she, she really, she's surprised, she's, the moment she reflects, she thinks. And that this work is by the master of Barberini panels. It's in Washington, in the National Gallery in Washington. And it's relatively small. It's 87 by 62 in centimeters. And it's a 1445. Uh, now, if I had the chance to interact with you and to ask the children uh, what is extraordinary about this work, especially if you compare this work with the others that I would later on show you, it's that uh, the Annunciation takes place on the street. We are not in a church. We are not in a monastery. We are not uh, in uh, Mary's house. Uh, uh, we are not in a cloister, but we are on the street. So this is quite extraordinary. And uh, this is this beautiful perspective of the colonnade and uh, as a uh, background, uh, the, the blue sky and that cypress uh, that really is standing out. But look at the uh, body language of the Virgin Mary. She is thinking and every time you see her uh, touching her breast and uh, kind of uh, lowering her um, gaze. It's a moment of reflection. That is a beautifully written by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Now we are, we are really going forward in time because uh, we are not in the 15th century anymore. Um, Rossetti was part of a brotherhood called the Pre-Raphaelites. And we are mid 18th 
uh, hundreds, so it's like 1850s. And you can see that the style goes back to the uh, Middle Ages. So they wanted to paint uh, the manor before Raphael. And this work is at Tate Britain. And uh, the composition is completely different, as you can appreciate, because uh, first of all, we don't have any more that frontal uh, description, the angel on the left, the Virgin Mary on the right, but actually the Virgin Mary is a little bit uh, uh, at the back of the room. And also she's caught in a, an intimate moment, she's in bed, and uh, the angel is in the um, foreground and holding uh, the, the lily, and uh, the Virgin Mary is really thinking. You can see that uh, her gaze is uh, full of absorption and uh, um, reflecting um, what's, what's going on. And the, there are three primary colors. There's a profusion of white here. The whole canvas is in white and it's extraordinary because it's very difficult to handle white on the canvas, uh, but you have blue, red and yellow, the pr primary colors. And uh, also the fact that the artist wants to identify himself in the Annunciation because uh, the angel is his brother, Michael, and uh, the Virgin Mary, his sister, uh, Christina Rossetti. Interrogation, the third moment, Leonardo, who better than Leonardo can really um, embody that uh, idea to investigate, to search, to inquire, to ask. And this is the famous Annunciation in the Uffizi Gallery, 1472. And uh, it was always commissioned for, for a church. Um, it's a, a, a huge, it's a, a big painting, uh, 98, roughly one meter by two meters uh, and 20 centimeters, so it's really big. Uh, the angel on the left, uh, the Virgin Mary on the right, uh, but you, you can see that uh, her body language implies uh, uh, questioning. She's touching the book. At the same time, she's uh, holding her hand. She's raising her hand. She's asking, well, what's going on? Uh, um, I, I want to, to understand. And uh, um, th this is a way, when you, when you see the Virgin Mary acting that way, it's the, the interrogatio, it's the inquiry. Now look at the uh, background uh, and uh, um, unlike the Simone Martini, the uh, Annunciation, the background was just a, a golden uh, background. Here you have a beautiful landscape with the rocks um, just uh, in, the, um, in the far view, representing the rocks, uh, the Virgin Mary as uh, the, uh, the rock, uh, the support. Now, one uh, incidental thing that uh, um, Leonardo was uh, so interested in representing this um, Annunciation, look at the wings of the angel, and uh, you can see that uh, up to here, uh, they were made by Leonardo, and he copied, really studied wings, bird's wings, and, uh, and the, th then they were lengthened by an, a later artist, unknown artist, and uh, has spoiled a little bit uh, our beautiful angel's wings. And then there is the submission, uh, you probably remember that our logo for the lecture was uh, the Beato Angelico's Annunciation, one of the un Annunciations uh, painted by Beato Angelico. And this one was uh, painted for uh, a cell, a room where a monk would sleep and would uh, pray, meditate, reflect. So it's just for a monk in a little cell in the um, convent of St. Dominic in, or St. Mark in, uh, uh, in Florence. And this is the, uh, the same Annunciation. You can see, I wanted to show you uh, the image where you can really identify the room with the, with the window, with the open window. So it was not to beautify the room or the space. It was just to invite the monk uh, for contemplation, meditation, and reflection. So the, the, the purpose, the sole purpose was of praying. And although it was only seen by the monk, uh, there is 
again, um, attention to certain elements. Look at the halo, the angel's halo and the virgin uh, halo, it's golden leaf. And there is a monk, uh, pro probably St. Dominic praying next to the angel. Now this slide I'm afraid is, is not very good, but I wanted to show you another um, submission image. How do you identify when the uh, when Virgin Mary finally accepts the message? Uh, when you see her with the crossed arms, that, that's the sign then um, she accepts the message. Uh, this Annunciation is in Cortona and uh, it's in the uh, museum of the cathedral. The reason why I wanted to show you this in particular, because uh, it's extraordinary, the, the cleverness of the Archangelico. What happens here? We know the story, the angel appears, the Virgin Mary, and there is a dialogue between the two. And the dialogue is embodied by the three lines. I don't know if you can see between the angel face and the Virgin, uh, Virgin Mary's face, there are, words, not very clear, difficult to make them out, but they are there. Now, the one in the center is the answer, is the Virgin Mary's answer, and it's upside down, and you read it from right to left. So only God can read that answer. Another example of the submission is the beautiful uh, Annunciation, always by Beata Angelico, and um, it's in the Prado Museum uh, in Spain. Um, you can see also that, again, the, the composition follows that format to have an um, uh, open-sided room, a loggia, uh, giving into a garden. But in this case, you have on the left, as there was uh, in the previous uh, one, um, the, the Garden of Eden. Now, these are details. Uh, so actually the, the, uh, the actual altarpiece is bigger and there, there are predella as well at the bottom. I wanted to show you this uh, image because there's the couple, uh, Adam and Eve on the left and the readings from the uh, 8th of December, the, uh, the first reading is from Genesis and it's the uh, Adam and Eve and uh, the um, they, they leave, they are um, expulsed from, from, um, the, from paradise. I like the way that uh, in, in a church, um, Beato Angelico, the blessed Angelico, uh, doesn't dare to represent Adam and Eve naked. Did you know that from the readings? I mean, they discover their nakedness, but actually they are dressed, they are clothed, and the only fig leaf reference is just the branch that you see around their waist. And uh, on the right hand side, you have the Annunciation. So there is this connection between the, the fall of the humankind and the salvation. And the only way to connect the two scenes uh, are the rays that you can see probably the rays from, from God, the, the light from God that comes from above. And uh, there's, there's like a band uh, um, crossing diagonally uh, the, the picture. So there is a connection between the garden and the um, Annunciation and also the angel's wings that <clears throat> are partially um, going into the garden. Now, here the, is the, uh, the rays from, from God. The dove, of course, is the symbol of the Holy Ghost. The crossed arms, so uh, another example of submission. But what I found extraordinary here, and that would have been a question for, for the children, where is a magpie here? There is a magpie just here. I don't know if you can see my arrow. What it's got to do a magpie with, uh, with the Annunciation? Now look at the colors. Magpie is black and white. And this is the, um, uh, the clothes, the Dominican clothes. Uh, they have a black uh, mantle and uh, a white tunic. So it represents the Dominica order and all the Dominicans worship uh, Virgin Mary and they are bearing witness to this moment that it's the most important one in human history. 
we've been talking about the uh, submission, but then you probably remember there was the, the merit. And this is an extraordinary representation of the Virgin Annunciate by Antonello da Messina, 1476. And it's in the uh, Palazzo Abatellis in Palermo. Now, um, Antonello da Messina probably uh, was the most important uh, artist in Italy at the time. Um, look at the style. Uh, it foresees Leonardo. There's a beautiful, beautiful chiaroscuro, darkness and light. But I would like with you to look at the, at the Virgin Mary. A question uh, would have been, where is the angel? And uh, we, we'll try to find out uh, later on. So it's a very, very mysterious. Now, uh, like the uh, Velasquez, the Immaculate Conception, uh, this woman is a Sicilian young girl. And uh, Antonella was incredibly uh, skillful in grasping the structure of the face. Look at the muscles, look at the sinews. Um, he really had extraordinary ability to create the muscles around her eyes. So there is a slight um, smile uh, and the, the, the shadows uh, near the, the nose. So in, incredibly effective. And there is no background. Look at the, the background is dark. Uh, why is that? No distraction. We don't want to be uh, distracted by uh, nature or by other scenes. It's just uh, the uh, Virgin Annunciate. Now the, uh, the blue, we, we, we have been talking about colors and the blue is very important because it's a royal status. So the Virgin Mary doesn't need jewels, doesn't need other decorations. It's just that color. It's the color of the people of Israel. So from the book of Numbers, the, the people of Israel um, are identified with blue. And also it's the way to follow the God's commandments. And last but not least, uh, blue is the translucence, the transcendence, the mystery, the divine, the sky. Now, as you can see, she clasps her blue mantle closed and holds it modestly. And uh, the, the fact that she's reading, it's a constant reference to the, uh, to the, um, the scriptures. Isaiah confirms the uh, and foresees the, the incarnation. And the book uh, pages are moving as if the, the Holy Ghost keeps on invading that space. But why, why there is no angel? Well, this is a question that <laughs> I'll leave it to you to answer. But uh, in a way, I think this is my interpretation because we occupy uh, the angel space. Um, we, I don't want really to, to be presumptuous, but we are like angels, but not in that way, but in the fact that we all kneel down in front of our lady. All generations will call her blessed. Her soul glorifies the Lord. Her spirit rejoices in God. So it's a her merit. completely different now. Uh, so we have, I hope it's been clear, these are five stages in the Annunciation. I would like to give you now two examples of uh, Annunciations that are not directly related to convents, monasteries, churches. Uh, this is an altarpiece that actually was commissioned for a church, but there is something extraordinary. Now, the angel is interrupted by somebody else. The only example, I think, in an Annunciation painting where there is a, a somebody that doesn't take part in the Annunciation. This is by Carlo Crivelli, and uh, the date is uh, 1486. And with great joy, I can say that it's again at the National Gallery in London. So as I said on my first talk uh, that we can always go, uh, when it opens, well, it, it is open, but uh, at the moment it's not on display, but uh, it will be very soon. And uh, it's big, two meters by 146, one meter, 46 centimeters. Now, uh, let's analyze uh, the, the painting. Uh, first of all, 
let's start with Our Lady. Um, she's just like a queen. The fact that uh, there is no covering on her head means that she's an unmarried girl and she's royalty. She uh, wears a coronet, um, like a crown. She's queen of heaven. And I would like to ask you uh, now, uh, what kind of stage are we in the Annunciation? We are in the submission, uh, the, the, the arms are crossed. And uh, I think that uh, it's the final stage and probably the angel, the Archangel Gabriel can be interrupted by Saint Amidius. I will tell you the story later. And here you can see the, uh, the hairdo, uh, very long hair, blonde hair, unlike the Sicilian young girl by Antonello da Messina and the Velasquez Immaculate Conception, the, the Spanish civilian girl. And here, look at the, unlike the Antonello da Messina, uh, the Virgin Annunciation, the richness of the decoration, the embroidery of the flowers, the foliage. You can see also that this is really um, a rich woman, but doesn't want to reflect uh, uh, wealth, uh, it reflects wealth in face. So you see, for example, that the sleeves are slashed and you can see the underdress coming, coming through and all the jewels and uh, also the attention. I keep the, uh, the image of the entire painting on the left. So hopefully you can identify here we are in the room uh, in uh, our Virgin Mary's room, and uh, this is the still life. Uh, now the, the, the slide here, the, the picture is not very good, but you can appreciate how skillful Crivelli is in painting the, um, the candle. The books could have, uh, he could have placed the books in a line. No, he wants to show off the red one, the green one, and the glass is very important. The glass reflects the scene, and the glass is something important because um, it's like the word of God that goes through glass and doesn't break. The, the Holy Spirit, you, you can see on the left hand side on the main picture that there is uh, in the sky a golden circle and the ray um, starts from that point going through the wall and reaching the Virgin Mary. So there is a bit of breeze and Crivelli uh, catches this breeze, this wind uh, in a way that it is unsurpassed. You see the carpet is, is moving. Now here you have other two birds, the peacock on the right hand side, I'm talking about the, um, the uh, magnified, the enlarged um, picture on the right hand side, you can see the peacock. And there is a, a, a little bird, they represent um, respectively um, the resurrection and the passion. So lots, lots of symbols here. And now we, <laughs> we, um, we get into this moment of interruption. Now look at the angel, I mean, it is incredible. I mean, look at the wings, look at the feathers, Look at the hairdo. I mean, look at the fact that the crown uh, on his uh, head is extraordinary, holding these lilies. And next to him, there is this man who dares to interrupt the Annunciation. And he holds a model of uh, a city, Ascoli Piceno. If you look, if you go to Ascoli Piceno, it's a city in Italy in the Marcus near Umbria, Lazio. And if you go there now, it's very similar to the model uh, St. Emidius uh, is holding. Uh, St. Emidius is the patron saint of Ascoli Piceno. What, what's he doing? Well, he's asking the angel to look after the city. And uh, uh, the date of the painting is 1486. Just uh, uh, two years earlier, there was a terrible plague uh, in Ascoli Piceno. And so the, the patron saint wants really to ask the angel, please look after the, the city. But there is another element that is incredibly important for the city of Ascoli Piceno. And here you have some characters in the picture that they are bearing witness to this moment, extraordinary moment of the Annunciation that it's a set, it's set in their city. There is the, this little girl and um, 
there's something in the background, very, very strange. There are lots, lots of the pigeons, or doves in the, in the upper part. So you see the, the picture above, um, they are perching on the beams and they are fluttering, probably because they're the wind of the Holy Spirit. But in the lower picture, you see uh, somebody reading a lecture, a document. It's called a bull from uh, Pope Sixtus IV. And it's just arrived, carried by a pigeon, because this is the, the way um, documents um, were um, sent, <laughs> pigeons. And there is a cage uh, you can see on the, on the edge of the, the parapet. And he's reading what? Why it is so important? Because if you look at, at the picture uh, above, the Libertas Ecclesiastica on the 25th of March, and that's the date of the Annunciation, the Pope has given Ascoli Piceno the freedom to rule uh, the town. So it's kind of an independence, although it depends always on the Holy See. So it's Libertas Ecclesiastica, the ecclesiastical uh, freedom. And there are three uh, coat of arms here that are, I don't know if you can see them. There's the, the first one is the Pope, the, 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 sorry, the town, the Pope and the Bishop. But strangely enough, there are, two uh, objects here and uh, the, and the big picture you see they are just at the bottom and it's a cucumber and an apple uh, beautifully uh, foreshortening and uh, foreshortened and also with a, with a shadow as you can see here and uh, again uh, Crivelli wants to show off and you can see Opus Carlo di Crivelli Veneti here is his signature on the right hand side the apple represents of course, the fall, um, so the, um, um, the apple, the, the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve, and cucumber, uh, strangely enough, uh, represents the salvation, represents uh, redemption. So the, la the last symbol here. So um, full of symbolism. The next one and the last one is by uh, Fratelli Polippi. Uh, it's an annunciation. I chose this one because uh, it was for a private use. And uh, we have seen all works that, that are associated to, uh, as I said, to churches, to convents. But this was uh, for a family uh, in Florence. And it was a very, very powerful uh, family, uh, the Medici family. The artist is Fra Filippo Lippi. And uh, the, the painting is at the National Gallery. And you can see that there is a, a symbol here, the three feathers. The three feathers are the symbol of the Medici family. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that now you know that the, the lilies are the symbol of uh, the Virgin Mary here. The, the vase is not a askew, but uh, actually the way the painting was displayed from a perspective point of view, the vase would recover the, the right uh, um, the right representation. So the angel in the garden, our lady in her room. But what is so relevant about this painting? Now, it was a part of the furniture. We don't know exactly what it was. If it was a bed head, so if you went to sleep, to fall asleep on your bed, you would have had uh, above uh, this beautiful uh, annunciation, or it was probably a panel uh, in the uh, wooden panel covering the uh, walls or above a door. And the shape that you see uh, reminds us of probably the shape of the architecture above the door. And this was in the study room, in the uh, Medici Studiolo, the study room. So every time uh, one member of the family, and, and we are late 1400s, so would step into the, uh, this uh, room, would immediately uh, deal or recognize the incarnation. So it was not only a message to holiness for people in a monastery or in the church, but the invitation to be holy and to look for holiness also in among lay people. 
And this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it or it was useful. And now if there are questions, I'm very happy at the moment that I prefer that you talk and I keep quiet and hopefully I answer the questions. Okay, so if you so, <clears throat> so if you have any question, you can write. Okay, so we have Anne. I'll give you one second. I give you the so now you can speak. Good evening. Thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting as the first one. So first of all, thank you very much. It's a good thank way you. to live the season of Advent. So I'm very grateful for um, all the explanations that you give. And I think we all look at this work of art differently now that we know better how to appreciate them and to read them. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. So I have a few questions. I was wondering in the different annunciation that you show, there are two of them where we see uh, in details the bed. And I was wondering if there is a reason, apart from the fact that uh, the painter probably wants to show that we are uh, within the house of Mary. But apart from that, is there a special, um, I don't know, a symbol or a reason for uh, displaying the bed? Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thank you very much. That's a beautiful question. Yes, I think that the, um, the, the bed and the bedroom gives the intimate space of the, the Virgin Mary. But also to remember that uh, at that time, a bedroom was the most important room uh, in the household, in a house. Uh, if you look at other paintings uh, of the time, um, the, the portraits, uh, of important people are in a bedroom because um, it was very expensive to have a bed and to have a proper bed. So uh, in a way that, that, that was a reference to the fact that it was the main room. Nowadays, we, we think of a bedroom that we, we would never invite our friends to <laughs> our bedroom. But uh, at the time it was really the most important room. I hope. I answer your question. I think also psychologically, it's, it's really important to be the fact that this, this union among the Holy Spirit and the, the Virgin Mary. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. I have another question. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> um, I know through uh, my husband that uh, Pope Six the Fourth uh, was the one who was between the first to um, promulgate the idea of um, Mary as Immaculate Conception. Uh, and I was wondering if, um, because we spoke of that <laughs> recently at home, I was wondering if in art, uh, I mean, was this um, idea of Sixth Pope, um, how do you say that? Was the art following this idea of Mary as Immaculate Conception? Was from that time, do we have Mary as Immaculate Conception more present in the art or did it take longer? For, for her to appear, because apart from Murillo, and you show Velázquez, you show the beautiful one of Velázquez, but uh, yeah, I, I was wondering from when in the art we see Mary as Immaculate Conception. It's a very, very good question. And I'm always delighted when I'm at the National Gallery to show Velázquez Immaculate Conception, because there is this misconception that the, the, the dogma was imposed by the church in the 19th century, but it was really rooted in the, the church tradition that it was a part of the, the church life, as you said, and then the brother James can help me here, but it was a part of the, the, uh, of the, the, the attitude that the, um, the people of, the, the, of God would regard um, Mary as um, immaculately conceived. Uh, it was from the early Middle Ages that the, the idea of the Immaculate Conception would, would spread. Uh, but the, the, 
um, it was, uh, I think it was a Paul, Paul V, but anyway, the, the, the Pope said that are late 1400s, early 1500s, but they really declare Our Lady uh, and the Immaculate Conception reference to Our Lady. You, you are right that this element is strengthened during the, the Counter-Reformation. So it, it's, uh, as you said, you mentioned Murillo and Velasquez, and it's exactly the time when uh, there's the, it's very important for the church through kind of imagery to uh, help the, uh, the people to, uh, to identify Mary as uh, the Immaculate Conception. So, and it's mainly, as you said, it, it, Spanish, Spanish um, um, art. Uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish art of the 17th century. So it's the um, counter-reformation uh, time. I don't know if, if Brother James wants to add something about the uh, Immaculate, but it, because um, Anne was asking about art, so I think that the, uh, I don't know, but uh, from a theological point of view. It's... But just to say that, I mean, yeah, so, so you're correct, so that the Immaculate Conception, the, the kind of the expression is obviously comes later in the history of the church, but if you look at the early church fathers, um, I can't remember exactly which ones, but I think St. John Damascene, uh, and maybe even uh, St. Maybe I think even St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, they many of, well, I can't remember the exact ones, but very early in the church, you had uh, church fathers talking about Mary as the new Eve. And I mean, even though they didn't really draw it out explicitly, the idea was that she was the opposite of Eve. And so, uh, the idea was there in that idea you had this concept that our lady was uh was you know in the same way that mary uh, that eve was disobedient she was obedient eve was a sinner she's all holy um and so you have and you have even church fathers already speaking about mary as all holy but you know there were debates on when exactly uh she she was freed from sin so saint thomas aquinas thought that she was con she was conceived with original sin and then the second hour, like the instant after that, God purified her of sin. So the debates were sort of when when did it happen? But most of the, literally every important theologian in the church thought that Our Lady was sinless. There's no theologian you can read that thought that Mary ever committed a sin. You'll never read that anywhere. So the idea was there. It hadn't been the church takes time to draw out ideas fully, but it's always been there in the church. And then then when the dogma was promulgated, it was just a recognition that this idea was always in the history of the church and always recognized. And we have a very early feast, uh, I think from the sixth or seventh century of on Our Lady's conception, not called the Immaculate Conception, but you know, something special happened at Our Lady's conception. So, uh, which, which is obviously related to grace. Um, so I don't know if that adds, a, adds clarity or confuses, but. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much to both. It's very, uh, very, very interesting and very, you all give different aspects of the question. So it's uh, very complimentary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> so now we have another question from Tommy. One second. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, in the, on the altarpiece, at the back of the altarpiece, at the bottom, there's a piece missing. Very good, very good, Tommy. Thank you for your question. So, where where is it gone? Uh, probably your question is hello, hello, Margarita. Now, um, the uh, as you have seen, the altarpiece is huge. There are um, more than uh, fifty panels, and uh, in the eighteenth century, seventeen hundreds, it was uh, dismantled, unfortunately, and it was a time probably. Uh, difficulties and uh, they didn't have money and they, people from abroad uh, would come to, to Italy to buy works of art. So it was dismantled and uh, some pieces were lost and uh, some pieces were sold uh, to other, the, other countries. I mean, we are very lucky in, in London that we have three, three predellas uh, from the uh, Maestà. Um, there is one in Berlin, one in Madrid, but most of them are in Siena. So to ask, to answer very quickly to your question, unfortunately they are lost. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tommy, for asking this question. So now we have, we have a question from Katerina. Maybe she can try to, she wrote it, but she cannot. Uh, why is Virgin Mary always on the right of the pictures? Very good, Katerina. Thank you for asking this because I didn't, uh, I was a little bit worried about the timing. I've got my um, alarm clock in front of me and I don't want to, to, to waste your time. Now, I wanted to, to um, exactly to, to tell you about the light that comes always from the left to the right. I don't know if you've noticed that all the paintings, nearly all the paintings, I've never found one painting where the light comes from the right to the left, always from the left to the right. And uh, the possibly the most important people are on the right uh, or you follow the, the narration, and you follow the story. So why, first of all, the light is from left to right? Because we, we read from left to right and most of the artists are right-handed. So if you write uh, or if you paint, the shadow goes towards the right. So you want to see on the left. So inevitably, you, the, the, the light comes from left and the shadow is to your right. And uh, that, that's the reason why the light comes from left to right. There is that sense of uh, uh, the, the way you read. So the angel came, so left, okay, the angel turned, and then the story develops, and then you, you meet the Virgin Mary on the right. So uh, there are few examples the other way around, but you're right, a good observation. The, the, the Virgin is always on the right. Yes, well done. Now we have a question from Tommaso del Bianco. Hi, hello. Well, I, I had exactly the same question uh, ah. as uh, Maria, so uh, I want to ask did, it. Did I answer your question? Just answer did... my question. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now we have a question from Nina. One second. Um, um, in the last picture, um, there's a hand coming up from upwards down, and what what does it mean? Very good, very good, Nina. Jenkuye, well done. <laughs> right now, very important. That hand is God's hand, and sometimes now I showed you some details. Um, but in some paintings, not only there is the, the God's hand, so it's a God's hand, okay? It wants really to show you that God is sending the rays, the light, the, uh, the Holy Spirit, because God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and uh, uh, Christ, Jesus, would be the Trinity. And sometimes you have actually the face uh, of God uh, on some architectural details like on the wall, but usually, usually is the hand, is God's hand, okay? Represents God. Did, did I answer your question, Nina? It's very, very important, very, very important because the action of God taking part, it's not the angel. The angel is just a messenger. It's not the, the, the one who is really responsible for the, for the incarnation, it's God, God. The word was made flesh. Okay, Nina, thank you, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Clotilde. Oh, certainly That's a very a difficult very question cool. now. <laughs> they are all beautiful questions and difficult. No, it's not a uh, mutant set. Anyway, I have it. Which city was the painting with the peacock? Right. Yes, Ascoli Piceno. Did, did you hear the question? The question is, I think that uh, you, Clotilde, you are referring to the, uh, the Crivelli painting. And uh, the, the city is Ascoli Piceno. It's a beautiful city in uh, the Marche. The Marche is a, like a county, a, a region, and uh, it's central Italy. And uh, yes, Ascoli Piceno. If this was the question, uh, the peacock, yes, was. Uh, yes, she said the microphone is not working. 
B is just an excuse not to speak much. Anyway, so the next one is Tom C. One second. You can do the question with us. I, I would like to thank uh, Mattia. Uh, you see, Mattia, uh, I, I would be lost without him. And that's a, a sense of belonging and depending. How can we live without belonging and depending? I would be lost. Hello. Hello. It was just an observation, really. I thought it was very sweet that the, um, the angel above Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden was look at the same hairdo and the same clothes as Gabriel with Mary. I thought this is a single moment of uh, everything happening at once, expulsion and and return. I just That's I right. don't know. I just thought uh, it's it right, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes. Yes, Tom. That that's uh, yes, it's the same angel, same archangel. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have another question, or it's just my my daughter that is writing on there. I, I was going to ask the, the children if you know. We always identify, for example, uh, the Virgin Mary with the the, the lily, the, the flower. Um, uh, the 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 flower was very important for Florence as well for the city of Florence because the symbol of Florence. I was going to ask you if in England we have. Uh, a symbol, a, a flower. Uh, but first, I would like to listen to Margarita. What, what's the question? <laughs> yeah, she's a bit shy, so I'll ask the question. Okay. 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 Yeah, what Tom mentioned, she was asking why the angel and uh, Our Lady are wearing the, uh, are, have basically the same dress. Mm, yes. Uh, sometimes they have a do you refer specifically to one painting or it's a general? Uh, the Angelico, um, yes. Yes, you're that, right. That's a more obvious one. Yes, 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 you're right, because the blue is always associated to, to heaven. And so the fact that the angel wears the same color as Our Lady implies that they are, they are joined together. I mean, that they are in, in heaven, in kind of the heavenly um, surrounding. So it's, it, that, that's the reason this is, as I said, the blue is real, is, color that is associated to heaven, to Israel, to royalty, to uh, divinity. So the angel comes from heaven and Our Lady is, uh, is as pure as heaven. So, so you're right, you're right. To identify the same nature, the same nature. Did I answer your question, Margarita? Please show up. <laughs> no, no. No, okay, okay. But did I answer your question? It's a beautiful question, you're right. Colors are very important in, in the paintings. They're not used by chance. Um, I don't know, I want to, to paint uh, violet or yellow. No, no, that there is a reason, always a reason. And the, the um, Beato Angelico used to kneel down every time he painted Our Lady. So, it, it, it's not a painting that should be shown in a museum, but <laughs> this is what we have now, should be shown where it belonged. Okay, good. This was the, the last question. Um, so we can, uh, we can conclude the talk. Just one uh, reminder that the next one will be Again, Sunday, because there was some someone that was memory so same time next Sunday. And uh, so now if you have uh, the file, if you want to download it, I will uh, I will uh, Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, I was saying that I think it's very short.
next Sunday on the 15th, you know. No. We'll be on, we'll be on Sunday, Sunday. Uh, on the 15th. And, uh, yeah. 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 Anyway, can you hear me now? Good. Sorry about this. Anyway, so the next section will be on uh, on Sunday, the 13th. So next Sunday at uh, 5 p.m. And and uh, yeah, so you should be able to download the files. So I will leave the 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 talk open for a while so you can download it. Or otherwise, if you are on the phone, you cannot see it. So you can go on our website. It will be available from tomorrow. Good. Thank you very much to everyone, to Maurizio, to Brother James, and uh, see you the next time. Thank you, thanks. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mauricio. It's a question of what can you for the sheet of the campaign? Ah, ah, certo, certo, ora, sì, sì. Mattia, ammuta tutti. Ah, 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 ah. Lo sto facendo? Sì, dai, non è. Ascolta, lo dico alla Daniela che si metta d'accordo lei con Michele? Maurizio è andato, vieni qua Maurizio. Mattia, aiuta a entrare tutti prima. Ah, ah. Puoi aiutare tutti in un colpo solo? Sì, no. dai, non è... Ascolta, lo dico alla Daniela che si metta d'accordo lei. Con... È andato in loop, è andato. Ah, ok, ci vediamo solo un secondo.